I hope you have found your place in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2. And we have many people that are out of town with their families and so forth this week, and we understand that. Some of our people are sick, and we'll be addressing that at the end of the service. But right now, we're here to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's put our hands together and welcome our listening audience around the world. I know this is a special day, and we thank you for taking time to listen to our broadcast. So I'm in the book of Luke, chapter number 2, and verse number 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Dear Lord, they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all men. For unto, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. That'll be all the scripture I read. Let me give you the context of what's happening to a very familiar story and then put a twist on it. The angel appears unto Mary and she conceives this virgin girl, estimated to be 14 years old, conceives the Lord Jesus Christ. Her and her espoused husband-to-be were to be married. And they lived in Nazareth and it was so abrupt that she was with child without man that even Joseph wanted to put her away. They lived in a small town of Nazareth back then in a small home in what we, we would call a small complex and in these small complexes they had mud and straw walls and they lived on dirt floors and those living in that complex shared a small what we would call a courtyard and it was there that all the inhabitants would come and they would cook and wash clothes and talk Mary became the talk of the town to dare try to tell people she had conceived without the assistance of man as she had bore the reproach with Joseph, she became great with child. She's nine months expecting now. And in the middle of being nine months and expecting, Joseph comes home and says, hey, pack some clothes. She said, where are we going? We live in Nazareth. Why would we want to leave now? He said, we've got to go to Bethlehem to pay Biden, I mean, to pay taxes. So Mary is nine months pregnant. You get this now. Nine months pregnant. Joseph loads her up on a donkey and takes her 90 miles away from home. She's away from her midwife. She's away from her mama. She's away from her siblings and her family. Every comfort that she would have enjoyed has now been taken from her. She's rode a donkey 90 miles, which took about four and a half days back in the Bible days to get from Nazareth down to Bethany. And when she gets there, the Bible says her day was accomplished and she brought forth her son. Yeah, I, I, I get that. Any nine-month pregnant woman rides a donkey for 90 miles, you're going to have the kid. You know that, right? And on their arrival, they found that there was no lodging available. They were offered a place where the animals rested as a place where they could at least be delivered from the elements of the night. And there in the middle of the night in what we would call a stall or a barn, Mary brought forth the only begotten Son of God and his name is Jesus. Jesus was born that night in an animal stall. She then cleaned the newborn baby. And the Bible said she wrapped him in swaddling clothes 
This is what the Bible says, Brother Doug, and placed him in a manger. I'm going to give you a little different twist of this story, if I could please today, by asking you a question. Why did she put him in a manger? Why didn't she put him on a table? Why didn't she put him in the loft? Why didn't she put him on a ledge? Did you know the word manger is mentioned in verse 7, verse 12, and it's also mentioned in verse 16? Never before is the word manger mentioned in the Bible, and never before is it mentioned after this in the Bible. Because this was a one-time event that the only begotten Son of God was coming into this world to pay for the sin debt of humanity. There's never been a day like it before, and there'll never be a day like it hereafter, the birth of Jesus Christ. So, I want to preach on why was Jesus laid in a manger. I begin to study the mangers and many different philosophies and pictures of mangers are brought out such as ours is made of wood with hay in it and some wrappings and a child wrapped in a blanket. But back in the Bible's days, the manger was about 18 inches high um, and it was about 24 inches deep and it was several feet wide. Believe it or not, mangers back in those days were made of rock and the center of it was hewed out and that was a place where they could feed and water all of their livestock. So basically, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, she cleaned him up, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and out of every prophecy God could have given those shepherds to look for the Son of God, he said, you will find him in a manger. He quoted that on three different occasions. Why was Jesus born in a manger, put in a manger? Why was Jesus laid in the manger? There... Jesus was placed, it seems it's simple, it seems it's easy, and maybe even common. But this baby, in this manger, is sending a message to the whole wide world. And that is what I want to bring to you today. Why was Jesus put in a stone trough 18 inches from the dirty floor? I want to mention several of them to you quickly. Number one, because he wanted to tell the world that you could come to him at any age. Had they put Jesus on a table, the children would not have been able to experience him. Had they put Jesus up in the hayloft, the children would not have been able to see Jesus. But when Jesus came into the world, they put him 18 inches from the dirt. That means, Brother Randy, that even little children could come up and look over the side of that manger and experience the birth and the presence of the Son of God. You know what tell that's telling us as born-again believers? You don't have to be old and wretched and broken and scarred and wore out before you come to Jesus. The best time to come to Jesus is while you're young, while you're tender, while life is easy, while things aren't complicated, before you get scarred and messed up, before you go to jail and prison, before you cover yourself in tattoos, before you have abortions, before you become a drunk, before you become a dope addict, before you become somebody of ill repute. Thank God little kids can come to where Jesus was born and look at him and buy faith even though they're not scarred even though they've never been locked up even though they've never been dropped the same Jesus that died for that crowd took the little children and said suffer them to come unto me for as such is the kingdom of God hallelujah Jesus was 18 inches off the ground so that children could come oh I wish this church I hope we're in the midst of raising a generation of young people that will get saved at a very early age. I don't want to visit you behind the chicken wire in a prison cell. I don't want to have to go to a rehab center and pray with you, though I gladly would. I don't have to go to a meth lab and pull you out or a beer joint off a bar stool. I'd rather lead you to Jesus as a little boy and a little girl and give your life to God. And you not only got a saved soul, but you got a saved life. And you don't have to live with all the scars and the regrets. That's the best testimony anybody could have. He came and he was in the trough, the manger, to show us you could come at any age. Number two, he was laid in the manger to show that you could come with any affiliation. Now watch this. So when Jesus is born, they lay him in a manger and they wrap him in swaddling clothes. And the angel said to the shepherds that were keeping the sheep at night, the flock by night, here's what he said. When you find him, he'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes and in a manger. Anybody else? 
ignore them. That's not the right one. Which may imply, Brother Randy, they were other people that couldn't find a place to stay. There may have been other children being born at the same time in obscure places. We don't know. But they said Jesus will be different because he'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes and they're not going to put him on a table or in a loft. They're going to put him on a manger close to the ground so that no matter what affiliation you are, you can come to him. So the first people the angel introduced Jesus to is not the political leaders and he's not the religious leaders. The Bible said he went out to the fields and talked to the shepherds that were keeping the flock by night. Now, if you'll study those shepherds at night, Brother Ricky, you'll find out that these were ex-cons. These were people that nobody would hire. These are people that could not get a job. These people were the embarrassment of their family. They were the outcasts of their community. They were people that nobody would hire. So what would happen is the shepherds would hire these, these low-lifers and these outcasts and these ex-convicts and put them out in the field at night while all the other, quote, decent people were resting these vagabonds and losers were out in the field trying to do the best they can to get back on their feet. And out of everybody the angel could appear to and said, look, the Son of God's been born and I want you to go experience him. I'm glad, Brother Guy, he went to the down and out. He went to the dirty. He went to the convicts. He went to the rejects. He went to those that have been all messed up. And they said, I got news for you. Jesus, the Son of God, has been born. The door is open, and I want you to come experience him. Let me be very clear. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how messed up you are. There's a God in heaven that can save you. He can forgive you. He can wash you. He can cleanse you. He can justify you. He can sanctify you through the blood of Jesus Christ. You could be a brand new creature I don't care what field you come out of doesn't matter your affiliation but at the same time brother Doug kings were on their way and when they found Jesus he was a small child probably around two years old and the Bible said they fell down same dirt and they worshiped him and gave him gifts you know what that's implying to me brother Abbott I don't care if you're a vagabond that don't have a dime in a pocket. Or I don't care if you're the king of a vast domain. It's level ground when you come to Jesus. Doesn't matter what your background is. You say, well, I'm black. I don't care what color you are. I'm Mexican. You think I care? I don't know what in the Sam Hannah I am. Probably I'm Heinz 57 with all the mess we've had in our family. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter if you're young or old. Doesn't matter if you're healthy or unhealthy. I'm telling you, God opened the door through Jesus. So no matter what background you come from, you can and still have Jesus in your heart. Does the Bible teach that? Sure it does. You can come in any age. You can come with any affiliation. Your social standing will not keep you or get you to God. Number three, you can come when you have an appetite. Why did they lay him in a manger? That's where you go to get fed. And that's where you go to get drinking water. The reason why they laid Jesus in that manger, Brother Randy, they were telling the world what Jesus later on said in John chapter 10, I am the bread of life. And if you ever get hungry, I'm the place you're going to have to come to to be filled. By the way, when he stopped the woman at the well, he said to her, If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you'll drink the water that I shall give thee, you'll never thirst again, but it shall be a well of water springing up in the everlasting life. If you're hungry today, I can introduce you to somebody that can help you. If you're thirsty in your life today, I can introduce you to somebody that can help you. See, Jesus was sent to satisfy those that are hungry on the inside. You'll never want to come to God till you get hungry. This is where the debate comes in in my ministry, and I welcome it. You don't get saved just when you want to. You just don't pray a prayer and get up and say, I'm saved. You have to get hungry. You've got to get honest. You've got to get humble. Something has to start bothering you on the inside. There was a day I lived in sin and loved it, and you did too. If you'd have knocked on my door and told me I was going to be a Christian, my wife sitting there, you asked her, I'd have shot you. I wasn't interested in God or the Bible or becoming a Christian or going to church. Are you out of your mind? Never crossed my mind till God got to dealing with me. 
And I'm telling you, when God gets to dealing with you, he'll change a lot of things in your life. All of a sudden, the things that satisfy won't satisfy anymore. The things you long for all of a sudden grow strangely dim. What is happening? God is making you hungry. He is making you thirsty, so it will drive you to his son. Here's what the Bible said. If the Spirit of God does not draw a man, it is impossible for him to get to God. There must be an awakening in your spirit that you realize that you are alienated from God and the best you can do will still, still send you to hell. You cannot deliver yourself no matter what you try, what you do, or what you don't do. And when you realize that, now God begins to give you the answer to your thirst and your hunger. You're not going to find it in religion. You're not going to find it in turning over a new leaf. You're not going to find it in baptism or reading the Bible. You must come to that baby in the manger that came with a purpose to deliver people from their sin. Here's what God said. You shall call his name Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with us. And here's what the verse says. For he shall deliver his people from their sins. You understand that's why Jesus came. We've had people come to this church and come to this altar. We have one sitting here today. She's my personal secretary. Has been for years. And I remember when Miss Blair started coming. She'd come on several occasions, been invited by somebody in our church. And she came two or three times, and I was standing right there. And she came to me after service, and she was crying. And she said, Brother Kid, I've never felt love and accepted any more than I have here in my life. But I'm not coming back anymore. I, I won't be back. And I said, well, Miss Blair, what, what has happened? Did something happened? Somebody say something? She said, no. And she's weeping. And this is what she said, Brother Charles. I'm not worthy to be here. You say, preacher, I'm not worthy. I said, Miss Blair, you don't understand. We're not here because we're worthy. We're here because he's worthy. And everybody in this building ought to be able to say amen to that. And Brother Tim, she kept coming. I baptized her here. She filled out a visitor's card. And I didn't even realize it at the time, Brother Cliff, but when she filled it out, she put on the name Charles Blair, husband. She had never mentioned Charles. I'd never met Charles, never heard of him in my life. Brother Ethan, I was praying in my office one day, and out of nowhere, that card fell off my desk, and I picked it up, and I said, Charles Blair. The Holy Ghost said, I want you to pray for him. Now, listen to this, Brother Horn. He said, I want you to pray for him. Then I want you to go tell his wife I'm going to save him. And this is how dumb I am. I said, but what if you don't? Holy Ghost said, I wouldn't have told you that if I'm not going to save him. Go get up there and tell his wife. She's sitting here asking her if it ain't what happened. She's standing in the back of the church one day, Brother Chris. And I walked back there and I said, Ms. Blair, I don't know your husband. Never met him. Wouldn't know him if he walked in the door. But God told me to tell you something. She said, what? I said, God's going to save your husband. And we both stood in the back of the church and wept. Never met him in my life. Didn't even have a phone number to call him. A couple of weeks later, a guy come walking in the door. I said, who is that? They said, Miss Blair's husband. I said, really? They said, yeah. And Brother Charles came down and sat where he sat. He came about three weeks. I met him outside on the porch, Brother Snap, and I put my arm around him. I said, Brother Charles, why don't you get saved? He said, I don't know, preacher. I don't even know why I'm here. I said, I do. God is a draw with you here. And it wasn't but the next Sunday or so, here he come. Down the aisle with tears running down his face. He's on our leadership team. She's my personal secretary. Some of the best people we got in this church. You know where all this starts? The Holy Ghost drawing people. God was looking for him long before he was looking for God. That's the kind of church we believe in around here. God has to give you an appetite. He's got to give you a hunger. And, and, and when all your failures and your brokenness and your addictions and your habits and your scars and your regrets and your sorrows, I don't care what you come with. You just come because, thank God, there's an eternal fountain that will satisfy you once and for all in Jesus Christ. Why was Jesus put in a manger? Not only because to give us an appetite for him, but to give us 
assurance. Now, this is where it gets a little deep, and I don't want to lose you here. Little did anybody know at that time that Jesus being in that manger, he was given a prophetic word about what was going to happen with his life. Before he ever spoke a word, before he ever performed a miracle, before he ever took a step, laying in the manger, Jesus was giving us a prophetic word. You see, the manger was made of stone. It was hewed out, as I told you. And the Bible specifically says he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, I looked that up. Swaddling clothes was cloths they used to bandage people when they were hurt. In the military, if they got wounded, they had swaddling clothes and cloths, and they would wrap them and tie them and would keep them from bleeding to death. And it was also the same garment that they wrapped bodies in when they died. So when Jesus was born, out of everything they could have wrapped him in, out of every blanket, Brother Smith, they could have had, they wrapped him in garments that you bury people in. And they didn't know it at that time, Brother Jody, but when they were passing the Son of God, Jesus was saying to them, let me tell you something, this ain't the last time I'm going to lay in something hewed out of solid stone, and this ain't the last time that I'm going to be wrapped in swathing clothes, but I'm going to give you a message. Three days after they rolled the stone in front of that grave, I'm coming out on resurrection morning, and brother, the grave couldn't hold him, and he came out with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Hey, hallelujah, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is giving us assurance. Our salvation was sealed. Our great high priest went to heaven, put the blood on the mercy seat. He's seated at the right hand of God. Oh, we have blessed assurance that Jesus is mine through the resurrection of the Son. Can I get an amen? Now watch this. I'll give you something else to think about. You can come not only with assurance, but you can come with agreement. Now watch this. He was laid in solid stone, correct? God gave his word on solid stone. We make tombs out of tablets of stone. Why do we use stone so much? Because it signifies something that's unending. It signifies being permanent, lasting, abiding, immutable, perpetual. And when God laid him in stone and the people come by and was introduced to Jesus and they received him as their personal savior, God was coming in agreement with man and saying this, this is not just for today, but this is a settlement forever. You will never have to do this again. Once you are in my family, you are permanently in my family. Now, I know some of you don't like that, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. I am secure in Jesus Christ. I didn't get saved by what I do. I don't keep my salvation by what I do. I am sealed and sanctified and, and set apart for heaven through what Jesus did on the cross. Now, somebody, I know you're going to call me. Don't touch your dial. Somebody's going to call me and say, if I believe that, I'd live like hell. You know why? You're not saved. I believe that, and I don't live like hell. See, when you have the Holy Ghost inside you, you don't use the grace of God for lasciviousness as a reason to sin. God has given us His eternal Word, His eternal Son, and His eternal salvation. I'm telling you, I've come in an agreement with God that I wanted to be His, and He wanted to be mine. No more than I can be unborn from my physical family, neither can I be unborn from my spiritual family. And because of that, it motivates me to want to be everything I can possibly be for God. So, a little girl reached the age of dating not long ago. 35, by the way. That's a, that's a good age. So she gets in the car with a boy, raised in a good godly Christian home, and they tuck, take off, spend the evening together. They pull up in the parking lot, and he opens the door and says, Come on, we're going to go in here and eat. And she looked at all the windows in front of the bar, in front of the restaurant, and it was all beer and liquor and whiskey and wine and dancing. And she said, I'm not going in there. I was raised in a Christian home. My mom and daddy loved God and taught me better than that. I don't dance. I don't drink. I don't do that kind of thing. I ain't got no business in a place like that. The boy slammed the door on her brother Derek and said, Yeah, I know what your problem is. You're afraid of what your daddy will do to you. That's your problem. You talk about wise. She said, no, I'm not afraid of what my daddy would do to me. I'm afraid of what I might do to my daddy. 
I know better. He has loved me and taken care of me. I'm not living right because God's upstairs with a bat ready to beat me over the head every time I fail. I want to live right because I don't want to bring a reproach on his name. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I don't want him to be disappointed in me. So if you really get born again, it'll make you want to live right. You agree with that, don't you? Now, let me close with this. Sure, it's right. Let me close with this. The manger, and I just thought about this while I was down in my study. It proved, brother guy, that Jesus was sinless. The manger proved it. Now, we're made of dirt, right? That's what the Bible said. God formed man out of the dust of the earth. We are made of dirt, Jesse. All of us. All of us men. We're made from dirt. You women wonder why we're pigs? Throw the clothes on the floor, put the underwear on the lamp. Leave wet washcloths in the shower, throw a towel on the floor. You wonder why we're nasty and dirty and you got to pick up all... We're made from dirt. What do you expect us to do? We're dirt. You ladies don't understand it because you came from a rib. You weren't made from the same thing we were made from. So get over it. You don't understand us, but we don't understand you either. You're kind of flaky in your own way too, right? So when you, when you equate with dirt, you're realizing you're a sinner. You remember when the high priest went into the holiest of holies and he had the blood to sprinkle on the mercy seat? He was fully clothed, Brother Adams. He had on the white linen, he had on the ephod, he had a hat on his head. Everything about him was covered and clothed except his feet. When the priest went back into that temple, he went barefooted. Because God was showing him no matter how holy you think you are, no matter how clean you think you might be, at your best, you're still dirt. So Jesus was born and they put him in a manger. And the only thing between Jesus and dirt was stone. Stone is what God wrote the law on. And the Bible said you break the law and one offense you're guilty of breaking all the law. But here comes the sinless perfect son of God. And they laid him above the law. And the law never trembled. And the law never shake. And the manger never broke. And it never cracked because he was above sin. Jesus didn't come into the world to be a sinner. He came into the world to be the Savior. And he who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. He never connected to the world. Jesus never had to apologize. He never grieved God. He never went against the law. He never smothered the Holy Ghost. He was the perfect Son of God. And when he's presented to the world, he is presented today as the resurrected King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now listen, you'll either come to him or you will go to hell when you die. Am I telling it right? Let's give the Lord a hand in the house today.